Then too, her whole body became so horribly disfigured that the regular contour of her body vanished. Her pale, death-like and emaciated head, often assuming the size of an inverted water pitcher, became as red as glowing embers. Her eyes protruded out of their sockets. Her lips swelled up to proportions equaling the size of hands, and her thin, emaciated body was bloated to such enormous size that the pastor and some of the sisters drew back out of fright, thinking that the woman would be torn to pieces and burst asunder. At times her abdominal region and extremities became as hard as iron and stone. In such instances, the weight of her body pressed into the iron bedstead so that the iron rods of the bed bent to the floor. These were the words chronicled in Begone Satan, a pamphlet written by Carl Vogel which documented a prolonged exorcism carried out on a young girl named Anna Eklund in 1928. Heavily documented at the time and later in Time magazine, it was alleged that she had been possessed by several demons, including Beelzebub, Judas Iscariot and Lucifer himself. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. The story of Anna Eklund is not one for the faint of heart. At the time of its publication in 1935, it would have been quite a terrifying and eye-opening education into the life and practices of one of the Catholic Church's more extreme solutions to the troubles of demonic possession. It is, however, also a tale that willfully obfuscates the history of its subject. There are precious few facts that detail Anna Eklund's early life. In fact, even now her name is not a 100% certainty. She has been named as Anna Eklund, Anna Schmidt, and many contemporary reports simply called her a certain 40-year-old woman. Dramatic as her story was, her name was just one of the details repressed following the incidents of 1928 as a means of protection from the public who may very well not have taken kindly to being around a person with such a strange and potentially threatening past. Of the precious few details concerning Anna's early life, it is generally accepted that she was born in or around 1882 in Wisconsin. Her father was named Jacob Eklund, with her mother appearing to have left the scene while she was still at an early age. There are no records of her name, nor where she had gone, or indeed if it was the case, what had befallen her. Anna was a practicing and devout Catholic who attended church several times a week and appeared to enjoy the religious ceremony and rituals of religion. She lived out the first 14 years of her life seemingly as a normal child for the times, though her father was rumored to have made even such a simple existence difficult for her. Jacob Eklund was, as far as we can tell, a difficult father at best. He was a drunk and not only against Anna's practicing of religion, but openly mocking towards the church and its ministers. On his deathbed, whilst having his final sacrament administered by a priest, he scoffed and insulted him, his last words those of hate. Though the records of the family history are not particularly detailed, he took a mistress named Mina whilst his wife was still alive and the woman of his fancy just so happened to be either his sister by blood or stepsister by marriage, and Anna's aunt. Mina had a colourful background of her own and was well known in the town for having a reputation of practising witchcraft and black magic. Most dubbed her rather straightforwardly as a witch, and as she passed through the streets, rumours flew quite openly. At some point between Anna's 10th and 14th birthday, Jacob had on several occasions tried to pressure Anna into an incestuous relationship, though Anna had flatly refused him outright. This pressure from Jacob and refusal from Anna, as one might imagine, caused no small amount of tension in their relationship, which now spiralled into a very dark place. It is around this same time, at the dawning of the 20th century, that we first hear of Anna in any real detail, as it is also around the age of 14 that Anna started to act a little differently. She began missing church and when questioned, told of how she was unable to attend, of how she felt revulsion in the presence of religious symbolism, 
and a physical resistance that was creating a literal barrier, stopping her from entering any religious buildings. She had also begun uttering sexualized thoughts of unspeakable acts. This behavior was deemed as a form of possession, and in 1908, Father Theophilus Reisinger was called in to perform an exorcism, which he undertook, apparently successfully, on June 18, 1908. Though this ordeal sees scant few mentions in any written history of the case, all seemingly went well, as again Anna's life falls into obscurity. One can assume that she lived a relatively normal life, if somewhat troubled. At some point, her father passed away, and once again Anna was finding it more and more difficult to practice her religion. This time her actions against her faith had stepped up, and she had found herself lashing out at her spiritual counsellor, at one point attempting to suffocate him. She was gaining compulsive urges to destroy her religious symbols and was hearing inner voices that were driving her to despair. She initially sought the help of doctors and after several qualified physicians had observed and dismissed her as being physically fit and well over a period of several years, Anna instead turned to the spiritual and enlisted the help of the church. Once in the care of the church, her counsellors themselves spent several years attempting to diagnose and alleviate her condition and failing. Though during this period, they took note of several oddities which they found difficult to explain in natural terms. Firstly, it was noted that Anna was able to understand languages that she had never understood previously and had never studied. In particular, it appeared that she now understood Latin and when priests spoke to her in the language, it was said that she foamed at the mouth, becoming enraged. Further, she was able to sense when blessed articles were in her close vicinity, becoming furious. Even normal objects which had no specific spiritual significance, but had been blessed or touched with holy water, would not pass unnoticed, and she would call the priests out on such objects, demanding them to be removed at once. When the priests caring for her began to suspect supernatural forces were at play, they asked Anna herself what she thought of the matter. She acted completely unaware and was unable to give any information regarding who or what may be behind the suspected demonic troubles that were now making her life so difficult. Finally, in 1928 and after many years of these observations, the church formally deemed Anna to be possessed, and once again, Father Reisinger, by now well-known and well-trusted for his work on demonic exorcisms, was approached to take the duty for a second time. It is from this point that a fuller picture of Anna can be built, as her time spent with Reisinger was documented fully. In fact, it is still to this day one of the most documented cases of exorcism performed by a member of the Catholic Church. The details of the ritual were witnessed by Father Joseph Steiger, a long-term friend of Reisinger's, and both witness accounts were included in a pamphlet titled Begone Satan, written by Karl Vogel and published in Germany in 1935. It was also published in English in 1973, and its original intentions were to act as an informational pamphlet to be handed out to seminarians of the church to both inform and educate on the subject of demonic possession and the practice of exorcism. This pamphlet tells of a very strange tale indeed. Father Theophilus Reisinger was born in Bavaria in 1868, growing up on his small family farm. Highly religious from a young age, he was just 12 years old when, while suffering from illness, he decided to devote his life to his God and at the age of 21 joined a monastery in Altotting, a village that still today stands as an important pilgrimage point after a statue of the Virgin Mary revived a young boy who had drowned in the river in 1489. During his period in Altotting, Reisinger decided that his future lie in the priesthood, but was denied the opportunity by the provincial father who declined his application. Unperturbed, he set off to study in Sasbach, and upon graduation with a strong recommendation in 1892, he left for New York where he stayed for a brief period before settling in Detroit, where he began his life as a novitiate. 
In 1899, his training and studies complete, he was ordained as a priest and wound up back in New York, placed in the St. Fidelis Monastery. His life took a more bizarre turn in 1912 when he was transferred to Wisconsin, where he undertook exorcisms and battled evil spirits. This work was not without criticism, and though he was well-liked generally, it appears there were some that were not keen on the amount of attention he bought to the perhaps unfashionable elements of the Catholic Church. In a short biography of his life, there is a passage that reads, We must add that there were some, both without and within the province, who could not see eye to eye with Father Theophilus. We think it true to say that the opposition was not due to the personality of the man, but to the nature of his work, more specifically to his exorcisms. Indeed, his life and work had been widely publicised in the press as he had become more and more embroiled in the practice of demonic extraction. No case had gathered more media attention at the time than his work on the exorcism of Anna Eklund, which saw him placed onto the cover of Time magazine and which now loomed large over his head as he prepared to battle with her demons for a second time. The drama of Anna's second exorcism in 1928 began immediately with her trip to the convent where the ordeal would take place. It had been deemed appropriate that everything would be organised and undertaken in strict secrecy and that Anna should be taken away from her home so as to not draw attention to herself and to allow her to return to a normal life after the procedure. No one was to know of the events outside of those directly in contact with either Anna or those working alongside and assisting directly with the exorcism itself. Father Reisinger had thought he had found a suitable location in a convent in Ealing, Iowa, though he first needed to gain permission from both the mother superior of the convent and the pastor of the local parish to carry out the duty within his working borders. The pastor, Father Steiger, was a long-term friend of Reisinger's and so when approached, though reluctant, he agreed that if he could gain permission from the Mother Superior, then he would welcome the ritual to be performed under his watch. This was a rather disingenuous deal on Steiger's part, who expressed his fears of the practice to both Reisinger and the Bishop. He had only entered into the deal doubting that the Mother Superior would agree in the first place. He was then rather dismayed to find out that Reisinger had, in fact, already gained the permission prior to his approach, and so the pastor anxiously stepped aside and permitted Anna to be transported to the convent where the exorcism could begin. Anna travelled by train to the convent itself, and the priest escorting her first found it necessary to make the personnel of the train aware of the situation as a precautionary measure. When Anna arrived at Ealing Station, though it is documented that she herself was very willing and happy to enlist the help of the church and submitted to an exorcism, she attacked the priests who had come to meet her, lashing out and choking them. Reisinger was to arrive at the convent on the same night as Anna, but by another route so as to keep the pair separate until the exorcism was to begin in proper. He had arranged to be driven by Steiger, whose car was apparently rather new and in perfect working order. On the night in question, however, the car failed to start and though no mechanical fault could be found, failed in making any headway towards the station where he was to collect the priest. Arriving two hours late, he found a calm Reisinger who merely shrugged off the complications as the work of the devil who, he stated, will try his utmost to foil our plans. Finally, all parties converged at the convent and preparations for the exorcism could begin in earnest. <laughs> 